Hey, it's Tay from Taymations, and today I'm gonna... What's up? What are you doing? I'm filming the... Why? Because that's how the videos start. But I'm the real Tay. No, I'm the real Tay. Get out! No! Oh! Oh! Oh, fine! Yeah. Do it yourself fine. then! Hey, it's Tay. How are you today? I gotta come up with a better intro. In this video, we're gonna dive headfirst into profound topics like the metaphorical manipulation of space-time by harnessing physical matter in the form of clay. Or to put it simply, I'm gonna build a space-time sculpture. If this sounds interesting to you, stick around to the end of the video to see what we build in action. And please consider liking the video and subscribing to Taymations. It helps me tremendously. Thank you. So why do I call it a space-time sculpture? Other than that sounding completely awesome and making a good YouTube title, it's a literal interpretation of what it is. There's a time flow of an object built into the physical geometry of this loaf. Why didn't I call this a time loaf? Before we go deeper into the sculpture itself though, I want to talk about the concept of world lines. Because I find this absolutely fascinating and it'll make everything else make more sense, trust me. The literal definition of a world line is the sequence of space-time events corresponding to the history of an object. It's a helpful tool for astrophysicists to predict the position of objects in outer space, but for us, it's gonna be a thought experiment to visually grasp the concepts we need to build a space-time sculpture. Every object in the universe is in constant motion and changing its relative proximity to everything else around it. And world lines serve as a way to plot the position of those objects in the four perceivable dimensions of space and time. <laughs> if you take the Earth, for example, and plot its world line, it would look something like a twisting tube jutting forward as time progresses. Now, depending on how granular you want to get, you can slice the world line into events or moments in time of any duration you choose. Obviously, time is fluid and it doesn't happen in moments, but that's impossible for me to understand, so... World lines. So we've got our world lines sliced up into events, and we can now see where the Earth was positioned in space at any given time. But the Earth is a relatively simple object. Really? After eons of evolution, five mass extinction events, all of human history, innovation, and the invention of the bidet, you call it simple? I mean, it's a sphere that creates a twisty tube boy of a world line. So let's look at something more complex. You. You're on Earth. You're sitting somewhere, eating a burrito and watching Black Mirror dreading the inevitable dawn of our dystopian future being ushered in by technology in real time. But you're not moving, right? Mm -mm. Well, you are, mm -hmm. because everything on Earth is moving. Oh. You're constantly hurling through space and time, changing your position relative to everything else. Even at rest, you're creating a world line as we speak. Yeah. And so is every single object, plant, insect, animal, and human in the universe. That's a lot of world lines. And what if you're not sitting still? What if you're running? Or jumping? Or falling into a pool with your clothes on? Wait, you're that? There's a great quote from the author Robert A. Heinlein that goes, Imagine this space-time event that we call Rogers as a long pink worm, continuous through the years, one end in his mother's womb and the other at the grave. So what does your world line look like? With world lines, we can perceive the past, present, and the future of an object simultaneously. But if that's the case, and the laws of physics are inherent, is the future position of every object in the universe already determined? Can we travel forward and backward in time? Do we even have free will? Anyway, I'm getting away from why I brought up world lines. Using the techniques of Stratacut animation, conceived and developed by David Daniels, we can actually build a physical metaphor for world lines and bring them into the three dimensions that we can currently control. 
In order to do this, we convert the z-axis, or depth, into time, slice the loaf into its events or moments, snap pictures of each moment as we slice, and play it back to reveal its time flow as a two-dimensional animation. So that brings us to this little guy. Want to see what's inside? This isn't really meant to be an in-depth tutorial, but I do want to show the building of the block so you can see what's happening inside of it. If you do want tutorials, let me know in the comments and make sure to check out David Daniel's channel. He's got hours of tutorials on there so you can learn Stratacut. Links are in the description. So this time sculpture contains the time flow of a face saying the words, where am I? Meta, I know. To build this thing, I first recorded the voiceover for the character. Where am I? Typically, voiceover is recorded before the animation and then animated too, but for this process, we're doing it a little bit differently. So I now have the recording and I know my animation needs to be at least two seconds long just to fit in the voiceover. I'll obviously want time before and after the voiceover, so let's call this animation six seconds long in total. I typically animate at 15 frames per second, and because I know the animation will be six seconds long, I'll end up with 90 frames. Also, I know that the two seconds of voiceover will be 30 frames in the middle of the animation. Now this is where it gets interesting. So when I'm slicing up a time loaf space sculpture, I shoot for my slices to be an eighth of an inch thick. In a perfect world where every slice is exactly an eighth of an inch thick, we can actually convert the six second duration of the animation into inches. 90 total frames multiplied by 0.125 or the decimal of an eighth gives us 11.25 inches. My loaf will be 11.25 inches long. So now I draw an 11.25 inch line on a piece of paper. I'm gonna use this line to plot the events of our animation in physical space. The time before and after the voiceover will be two seconds each. Two multiplied by 15 frames per second and multiplied again by 0.125 gives me 3.75 inches. This won't be perfect, I mean, Unless you use the metric system, of course. I should use the metric system. Anyway, I'll draw a line at about 3.75 inches into the beginning of the first line, and another line 3.75 inches from the end of the first line. This section in the middle is for our voiceover. This is where it becomes more of an art form than a mathematical formula. I'm going to plot out approximately where I think the mouth shapes for the voiceover should fall in this section. So it starts with the W mouth shape. I'll draw a line here with a little drawing of the mouth shape here. I'll do this for all of the consonants in the voiceover until I have this. And it's clay time. Clay time. I'm building this block from the bottom up, almost like a 3D printer would print something. After a base layer of skin tone, I start building the most complex part of the loaf, the mouth. I wanna go from a closed mouth to the mouth shapes of the voiceover. I'm imagining the world line that the mouth would make going from a closed mouth to the first mouth shape, from the first mouth shape to the second mouth shape, and so on. This is just a process of stopping to imagine the flow of the changing shapes and how the face of the block will look when it's sliced. I slowly shape the clay and fill in empty spaces with black clay that will work as the empty space inside the mouth. This is how the finished bottom jaw looks. The top half follows the same process and it ends up looking like this. If I were to slice this right now, it would be a disembodied mouth saying the words, where am I? which would be pretty funny, but I wanna make the entire face, so onwards we go. The nose doesn't change shape during this animation, so it's much easier. It just changes placement depending on how open or closed the mouth is. For the eyes, I'm gonna keep it simple and cartoony. An easy cartoon eye is just a thin black tube wrapped in a sheet of any color and then wrapped with thicker sheets of white clay. It should look something like this. To make the eyes blink, I just cut 45 degree opposing angles and fill in the empty space with skin tone clay. As you're slicing, the eye will disappear and then reappear, giving the illusion of a blink. The eyebrows are also simple and are just thin black sheets that I flow into different angles depending on what emotions I want the face to convey throughout the animation. After filling in spaces and giving him long green hair tubes, it's done. Also, don't worry, it looks much better after being sliced. It is time to slice the loaf. But first, thank you for making it this far in the video. If you like this content, 
please tickle the like button. Where am I? Wow, that was really nice. So a couple key things to mention about this animation is that I actually sliced the block backwards by mistake. So I ended up having to reverse the animation so that the lip sync still matched up. Plotting the mouse shapes on the piece of paper isn't an exact science, but more of an art form. Because of that, the lip sync didn't perfectly match, and I just ended up having to speed it up to 24 frames a second and it matched almost perfectly. I think it turned out great, and as always, thank you for watching, but before you go, I just dropped a sad animator t-shirt in my merch store for all you sad boy and sad girl animators out there. And with that, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.